Hi everyone, it's Amiya Khan here with a Fox 10 News Now update. Now I wanted to start things off by playing the trailer for the documentary Hooked on Heroin. Now this documentary was produced by the students at ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and it traces the rise of heroin use and its impact on Arizonans through the stories of addicts themselves. Now um, this documentary is actually going to be airing on all broadcast stations throughout the state of Arizona today at 6 30 p.m. including right here on uh, Fox 10 so make sure to check it out and I'm going to play that trailer for you guys right now is literally like the devil you think you can move away from it it's going to follow you no matter how far away you go Heroin is an absolute epidemic. Maricopa County is the distribution hub for the Sinaloa cartel's heroin market in the United States. It's a drug that devastates an entire society. The only two outcomes of, the, of heroin are prison and death. Watch Hooked, tracking heroin's hold on Arizona, January 13th at 6.30 p.m. It is literally like... All right, I am joined now by Debbie Moak. Debbie, thank you so much for joining me. You are the founder of Not My Kid. Yes. And that is an organization that really just focuses on um, improving the lives of youth and making sure they don't fall into the traps that are out there. Very well said. And one of the ways that we go about that is by employing young men and women who are in recovery and working with them and taking our messages directly to students in the school setting, as well as parents and faculties mm -hmm. across Arizona. So you know about this documentary that's airing. We do, and we're excited about it. It's a long time coming. So, I mean, can you talk about just, uh, I guess, the heroin problem here in Arizona? So heroin, this is, this is a topic that Not My Kid has literally been watching since 2005. In 2005, we knew it, not my kid, that we had an epidemic brewing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you recall, but during those years, there were about 11 drug dealers who were arrested and cell phones were tied to thousands of our Arizona youth and heroin. So here we are finally in 2015, right. 10 years later, but I'm, I'm at least glad to see that we're ready to begin tackling this here in Arizona. Right, when we uh, announced to our Facebook page that you were gonna be here, we actually got a lot of questions and comments Great. Um, that I wanna pull up now. I'm gonna just grab those here. Um, we have a lot of them. Okay, I kinda wanna start with some of the comments, not the questions, sure. because a lot of people were coming out and uh, sharing their own story almost, and it was really, it was nice that people were able to just come out and speak well, it's understandable. without that fear. Yeah. yeah, so let's go ahead and pull that up right now. So this is from Elizabeth Dabrowski. Now, Elizabeth is saying that it's absolutely true the only outcome from this is death or prison. My son died in November from that narcotic. He was 24. He used it for several years. It is the hardest drug to stop using. At Amanda Stevens, just search opiate addiction. It seems like she was uh, responding to someone else on the thread. But uh, I mean, when you read stuff like that, I'm sure you hear that stuff all the time. This is coming from a mother. And it's, I mean, that's the whole you know concept behind the name, not my kid. It, it's from that yes. parent perspective. Well, I know exactly, first of all, what it's like to be that mom. Right. I'm fortunate that I still have my son today. And Elizabeth, I am so sad for you. Um, this is why we're doing what we've been doing for the past 15 years here in Arizona and not my kid. Mm -hmm. um, we see all too often kids starting down this path. And our job is to A, prevent. We're out in the community working hard to make sure our kids understand the risk and consequences sure. of heroin and other substances. And then uh, we find ourselves in the position very often of helping families to intervene and turn it around by identifying signs and symptoms and what does this look like? What might I find in my kids' sure. room? And then what are the resources the community has right. to turn this around? And before I go to you know our viewer questions, I actually just one popped in my head. How are kids typically exposed to drug in the, the drug in the first place? Yeah. Well, here in Arizona, we have two primary ways. Um, number one would be uh, drugs coming across our borders. Mm -hmm. Literally, we in Arizona 
supply about half from Mexico, about half of the consumption to the U.S. of heroin. But it comes through Arizona first. The other way is the connection to painkillers, which are the number one abuse category category of drugs mm -hmm. in this nation. Uh, Oxycontin, oxycodone, hydrocodone, Vicodin. Those are opiates. So if you like that feeling, then very often we'll find that kids will change from, it's harder to get an Oxycontin pill and more expensive to get than to switch to heroin. So coming across our border, typically here in Arizona, we see number one, black tar heroin, as well as brown powder heroin. And I mean, is the feeling, is heroin and the feeling of heroin comparable to that of oxycodone or Vicodin? It is. Okay. And actually, you know, I, I read a blog by a young man who's in recovery just the other day, mm -hmm. and you know, he described it in the beginning at least as um, di very different than a cocaine or meth where with cocaine you may feel like king of the world and all powerful and um, math, just, you know, extreme energy and euphoria. I've, I've heard it described more as um, just feeling right with the world. Mm -hmm. And um, this is this is the battle. When you, you like that feeling and get used to that, literally, the longer you use it, the harder it's going to be to get off. And your body goes through... Uh, aches and pains and withdrawals that are unbelievable. It's actually interesting that you brought that up right now because yeah. the next comment mm. that I'm bringing up comes from Trisha Joy and she just comments that it's not easy to stop anything cold turkey yeah. and it's impossible to wean off heroin. Therefore, detox and recovery of this and other opiates are harder to get through without succumbing to the mental anguish yes. the mind puts us through thinking we need the drug to survive. And I, I would say to Trisha that um, this is also a substance we're not generally you're not going to go into a 28 30 day treatment program right and you're all fixed first of all the detox process alone um, is lengthy right just to even begin to get the drugs out of your system mm -hmm. and start through any type of recovery right. so this is um once these doors are open a heroin will, addict will tell you I mean, it's certainly possible. Recovery is possible, but it's the hardest thing you'll ever do. The hard is it the hardest drug to recover from? But you know, the, I, I, there are a lot of drugs that are very difficult to recover from. Certainly, meth. Certainly, heroin. I, I would put at the top of the list. But 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 a lot of people are dealing with a lot of substances. I'm not going to minimize. Um, the withdrawal of cocaine sure. or any other substance. All right, well, I want to, you know, we have a lot of comments, but let me pull up questions. I have at least 10 questions up here that I want to get through. Uh, this first one, Michael Graff, if you use heroin, what is the average amount of time someone can use the drug until they're addicted? Wow, that's a great question, Michael. Um, I don't necessarily want to say it's a first use. For some people, it's more gradual, and it also, I would say to that, what are you starting with Oxycontin? Or are you starting directly with, with heroin? It has very much to do with how much I weigh, how much I use, what are my personal propensity, maybe genetics, mm -hmm. toward addiction. Um, but you would find that heroin addicts would tell you it does occur rather quickly. Okay, well, thanks for answering. For some people, it is first time. Right. And yeah, this is actually someone who was responding to Michael on the thread and just said, one time the high is so high and euphoric, then you never get it again. You chase right. that euphoric high feeling sad. I've seen so many addicts in my town. So what Jill is actually referring to also is called chasing the dragon. Is that a It's a term, term. for your, generally, your first high and what a heroin addict will do do then is chase that high for as long as they're using, looking to replicate that very first euphoria. And there is, and is it very difficult to replicate that? It first never feeling? happens again. I see. 
and they just think that if they keep going, it'll... Yes. Oh, so think about that. What would you do if you're not feeling as high and you don't have that sense of euphoria? Mm -hmm. Use a little more. Um, right. Another slippery zone is um, combining it with other things mm. um, to produce that euphoric high. Right. Now we have this next question from Los Cuiveras. What's uh, there, as in your, what's your view on the legal drug methadone that is given to most heroin addicts to help them kick heroin and they only become even more addicted to this legal drug and it's okay because the methadone clinics get rid? Okay, well that's an opinion, but I think the question here more so is, yes. I mean, where does methadone, what role yeah. does it play? You know, I think that's a great question. I know it's a very controversial sure. question. Personally, I have to say, um, I feel there's a place for methadone in recovery. Mm -hmm. Do I want to see an addict simply replace heroin with any other substance? If it is something that is utilized to step down, monitored, and appropriately used in recovery, I think it has a place. But I, I also believe that too often it's just simply switching out one drug for another. For another. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for that uh, question, Los mm -hmm. Guevara's. We're going to go to the next one. This is from Andrew Day, and it was like a three-parter. Um, Wouldn't it make more sense to legalize it and let Darwinism take its course? Mm. Haven't we been losing the war on drugs since the war began? As sad as it is to watch a loved one fall to addiction, shouldn't people have a right to their own bodies, or does that only... Okay, and then another opinion, or does that only apply to women in terms of abortions? I think keeping it on topic with yeah. heroin, it's, I mean, I guess, like, in what role does the government play when it comes to, you know, these illegal drugs? Right. Well, Andrew, I would say that it's a v very important role um, that our government does play in keeping many dangerous things away from individuals not only drugs. Right. We can think of other examples that the government does play a role in keeping its people safe. Right. So on the one hand, I'm all about freedom and choices mm -hmm. and liberty. I get that piece. But when it comes to a substance that is taking the lives of 46 people a day in That's this country, terrible. I am simply not okay with giving people free will around dangerous substances. Right, and I think just to piggyback on that, isn't it, I mean, a lot of people, they just need the help to recover. It's not like they're using this for fun. If you right. don't have a source or a way out. Right, that's well said, yes. Yeah, and that's what you guys help with as well. So correct? again, or? at Not My Kid, our primary function is to make sure that we educate kids parents and faculties in this community, get them all on the same page about what's really happening mm -hmm. here in Arizona and prevent. Because again, even the best recovery rates are low. Mm -hmm. Who wants What are to, the rates? Uh, again, depending on the individual and drug use, generally speaking, less than 10%. Wow. That's abysmal. So quality of life mm -hmm. is is this a choice that we want for individuals for our youth our communities and, and it's also something where it's like you know a lot of people will maybe they want to try a drug just to say they tried it and not knowing how addictive it is and right. not knowing the consequences I feel like that alone the education is so important and essential you know and to tell you how addictive it is I, I sat over at a treatment center some time ago, um, literally with Dr. Drew Pinsky. Mm -hmm. And I talked to a father of three. He was in treatment for heroin, and he said, in his own words, said to me, you know, if there was a car coming right toward my kids, and to the left of me was a hit of heroin, I would choose the heroin. How sad is that? If that isn't telling about how strong and addictive this right. substance is, I'm not sure what is. That's so unfortunate. And I, I mean, I feel like that's, I think that's a very big part in the fight against heroin. It's educating parents, it's educating kids about how addictive it is and how 
bad the consequences are. Right. Well, we, we know from history right. that when we do a good job educating the community about how dangerous something is, right. use does go down. That's why right. tonight is so important. Right. When we go to sleep at the wheel, and whether we intend to or not, message to the community mm -hmm. that all is well and safe, use does go up. Right. So tonight is critical for the state of Arizona to get out there. This is very dangerous and it has, I, I like the promo that they're playing. Right. Uh, it's death or prison. Right. Um, this next question comes from Maddie Garcia. She asks, how much damage do you think heroin will cause 10 years from now, just overall? Wow, Maddie. Um, great question. If I look back to 10 years ago, I could never fully have imagined we'd be where we are today. So I, I am actually going to be more hopeful that things like this, programs like this tonight, will wake up the community. One of the things that we have to do, for example, Florida had a huge heroin problem. What did they do? They um, reduced the number of painkiller prescriptions mm -hmm. and actually uh, overdose has gone down. So we have to understand the link to mm -hmm. prescription uh, painkillers. Right. We have to reduce those and take a lot of that supply out of the community mm -hmm. and then we will reduce heroin addiction. So do you think it's on the doctor's part to maybe prescribe something like ibuprofen, telling them to get over-the-counter Tylenol, for example, Advil, uh, things like that? Do you think that, I mean, because... I think that's a, certainly right. a piece of it. Um, if, you, if you look at what's happening, typically you'll find in any state that a large number of the prescriptions for painkillers sure. come from a small segment of doctors. Why are they dealing with so much pain right. and so much of the prescribing? Similarly with dentists though, I mean, I know I've been prescribed both Vicodin and Oxycodone just from dental visits. So I'm curious, I would ask you, when you stopped using it, what did you do with your prescription? They're still in my cabinet. And therein lies part of the problem. Uh oh, <laughs> not, <laughs> not for you, right? Right. I'm not clearly worried about yeah. you, but I am worried about who comes into your home and takes that mm -hmm. to either use or sell. Right. You literally, by not properly disposing of mm. that, you're helping to keep the supply available. Mm. So what is the proper way to dispose of these kind of drugs? You know, my favorite way to get rid of it is to crush it up, put it in a baggie with something gross like kitty litter, I see. Um, sawdust, something sure. that you're not going to then ingest. Right. Because what you don't want to do, you don't want to take this and put it into your, the water system, right. flush it down the toilet mm -hmm. or anything. I, certainly, um, law enforcement has drop boxes. Mm -hmm. that, that's great. But again, my favorite way is just get rid of it right by away. making it unedible. Right. All right, we have some more questions ahead. I feel so bad. I feel like I was just in trouble. <laughs> I feel like I have to go home now and open my cabinet and, I don't know, start crushing pills. <laughs> Good. Um, let's see, we have this question from Amanda Stevens. Amanda asks, what are the signs that someone might be using? That's a good mm -hmm. question. That's a really good question. Um, typically, I would start with a pinpoint dilated pupil, lethargy. You might even see someone that's on her heroin literally fall asleep while you're talking to them. The head just kind of droops and they nod off. Very often, they, when everybody else in the room may be warm, they are cold, very cold. Mm -hmm. um, depression certainly is a sign of heroin use. Right. Um, I mean, then there are other things, many other things that they go through, right. such as vomiting, nausea, constipation. And, and I just ask your audience, does that sound like fun? Is that let's go use heroin. I mean, if, if you look at the side effects from this. Right. And again, that's, that goes back to the whole uh, educating people point. Right. It's, I mean, I know kids out there, they do want to say they try to drug, whatever. It's the cool thing to do, but this is a really dangerous one yeah. to try. Obviously, it would be great if all kids out there weren't trying any drugs, but 
to know how severe the effects are oh. and the influence that heroin specifically has right. is it, I think it's so important that so, kids learn about it because, you know, right. growing up, uh, I mean, in sixth grade, we had the D.A.R.E. program and it was just, mm -hmm. you know, it was a general mm -hmm. say no to drugs. But I don't really right. think that I ever got the education on really the side effects of very specific drugs and that step. But like what we're talking about now is something that I think I should have. I mean, I've never done heroin, but well, like I something that kids need to know. Again, you just mentioned something that is important to me as well. Not my kid doesn't take that type of approach in education. Here we are working with real young men and women who mm -hmm. have a minimum, and by the way out there, if you have a minimum of a solid year of recovery, come talk to us, interview at Not My Kid. We may be able to work together to educate more young men and women in the community mm -hmm. um, about the dangers of substances like heroin. Let's see, we have another question. Trisha Anderson, why isn't there more treatment options here in Arizona? Why is it so difficult to get someone help? Wow, that's a great question too, Trisha. Um, it, it is challenging. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say it's not. Certainly finances, let, let's be honest. It's expensive. It's very to expensive to go to rehab. We know that it takes a long time. Um, most people will go into treatment, then they'll maybe move into a sober living house or halfway house. Here, here's what I would say. There are treatment programs available, and as a matter of fact, if you or someone needs one at Not My Kid, we will and can help you with free resources to get help here in Arizona. But Trish is right, it's not easy but it does exist so if you need that kind of help contact us at not my kid specifically ask for sam in the office and he'll help connect you to free resources the other thing i would add not again that this is the easiest route there is a uh, a meeting on every corner of almost every hour in this valley for recovery so the resources do exist. You may not be as familiar as sure. we are at Not My Kid with them. Mm -hmm. And if that is something you need, give us a call and we will help hook you up. She is right though. Mm -hmm. Do we need more treatment options, better treatment options? Yes, we do. Is, uh, is rehab something that's covered under health insurance? Or? You know, it's a good question. For some insurance it is. Mm -hmm. Very often it isn't. Mm -hmm. Sometimes your insurance may pay half. And you might need a really good insurance and maybe yeah. some of the people that are using maybe might not have as comprehensive of a coverage. Right. Well, the other thing here in Arizona, typically insurance tends to pay more for what's called IOP, intensive outpatient. Mm -hmm. I, um, that, that can be effective for some people, and certainly if that's all you're offered, let's run with that. But um, I prefer, personally, uh, residential treatment programs, and as long-term as you can make it. There is a direct correlation to recovery mm -hmm. to the number of days in treatment. That's, that's amazing, that's great. Yeah. So it's good that, I mean, I guess the more treatment people can get, the better. Right. So by the way, all you viewers out there, you can leave comments via YouTube and we can bring some of those up and talk about them. We actually have one from Summer Chambers. Uh, Summer asked, how come the police don't pick up the ones walking the streets that seem to be under the influence of heroin or methamphetamine? I can point that out in my town. Get them off the streets, please. Oh, uh, well, that... That's a really great question. It certainly makes me sad. I, mm -hmm. you know, feel like I may have seen one just here, oh, pulling, just, yeah, just pulling in here. Um, you know, I'm one of those people. Uh, Summer, I, I personally wish I could go out and round them up all myself and put everybody in a house and um, let's all get healthy together. I really do feel that way. I know that's kind of crazy, but I care about addicts so much and what they're going through. Um, I don't think they, re it's not that they're happy and having a great time and want to stay in that position themselves. This is what they've gotten themselves into. Right. And we need to do a better job, A, preventing, but B, supporting um, our addicts in recovery. Right. 
Right. And actually, that is a great lead into our next question from Trisha Joy. How can people detox from heroin safely without medical intervention? Wow. Uh, you know, I would certainly prefer to see anyone who's trying to detox from heroin in some mm -hmm. type of program um, where they can be supervised. But certainly, we all know stories um, of people. I literally know of a situation where a grandmother took a grandson in for a weekend, sat in the bedroom with him, and watched him detox for several days. What is the detox process? So, you mean just doing it on your own? Right. Just like, literally for example, stopping. that grandmother sitting there with her grandson and watching him, what is she watching? Yes. What is that? You know, you're, you're probably, first of all, watching someone with a great deal of aches and pains. Aches and pains that you and I can't even begin to fathom. Right. Um, and, you know, going through just a very scary and ugly process to, to get that drug out of your mm -hmm. system. And it's not quick. This takes a very long, long time. It's unfortunate. I know we have another question from YouTube. Uh, Stephanie Aportella. Stephanie asks, what advice do you have to those who have been using and are unable to stop and do not have money for treatment? Mm, again, I would say contact the Not My Kid office. We do have a list of free resources here in Arizona. Mm -hmm. um, we will help connect you to those. You know, you can always go to an AA meeting in this town at any hour of any day mm -hmm. and ask for help there. You can go to a Narcotics Anonymous meeting, um, literally if you have no resources. Mm -hmm. But I think step one, you know, ask someone for help right. through the process. But, you know, I think there are, I, I, I think I heard there are like 1,700 meetings a week here. Right here, in, just for AA yeah. or heroin? Uh, no, just for, AA. But you can, for heroin, go to an AA. Right. Um, go to a NA meeting, mm -hmm. Narcotics Anonymous, and find help. I would also say to someone who is loving an addict, whether it's your spouse, your child, you need to get help too. Because emotionally, it's probably so overwhelming if you can go to therapy or whatever it is, right? It is, and I, I would add to that very often just by, there's a dance, uh -huh. let's say, between the addict and the, the person loving the addict, right. generally an enabler, mm -hmm. someone that's helping them or allowing them, I should say, to continue the behaviors that uh, keep them in their addiction. So sometimes when you change up that dance, you, you're not willing to play your role any longer mm -hmm. as the enabler, and you're setting different boundaries, different loving boundaries. Right. Um, a lot of times that will begin to change the addict's role as well. Can you give me an example yeah. of, let's use spouse for example, right. how can a spouse be the enabler? And if the spouse is an enabler, what should the spouse do to change things up? Right. Um, I would start by going to a Al-Anon meeting, a PALS meeting. You can Google that, go online, there are meetings everywhere, and work with them. Learn how to set loving boundaries but boundaries that don't allow the person to, for example, very often addicts will ask for money, mm -hmm. um, a place to live, a car to drive. And too often we provide things that may have sped up them getting help mm -hmm. if we weren't providing. Right. We're getting more questions. I love that you guys are, you know, interacting on YouTube. I think that's the great thing about uh, doing this, you know, digital thing yeah. that we do here is that we can hear directly from our audience as we're talking here. And nice. um, we just had some uh, question from Paula Magallanes. I think I'm saying your last name right. 
hopefully. Um, if my brother were to go to his primary care doctor, could that doctor prescribe him something for the detox instead of having to wait periods of time to get into a sober living place? Because the waits are so long, he loses hope and refuses to go. For example, like Maverick's house. Yes. Um, they, they all differ. Again, contact Not My Kid and we'll help you to find the right resource that will help you with a detox. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, good for you for hanging in there with right. your friend. But at any point, they can lose their lives. So priority is taking action as quickly as you can. Right. By the way, this is something I tell people all the time that plays right into this question. If you know you have a loved one who's using any substance, uh -huh. have a plan made up in advance. Generally, addicts like your friend, they it's have your brother, actually. a brother. Yeah, that's wow. even, I think, harder oh. to emote, you know, that's yeah. your family. So develop a plan and have it in place and in waiting mm -hmm. because sometimes addicts will have a moment of clarity and what typically happens then the loved ones start to try to figure out resources try start to try to figure out where to go first and then that that window closes mm -hmm. so if you are someone loving an addict in your life mm -hmm. Let's make a plan now so that when that moment comes and you have that opportunity, that window remains open and you're able to get them help. Contact us at Not My Kid. And again, um, well, the we website will, is notmykid. Notmykid.org. Org. Okay. And we'll help you with resources um, and, and get a plan in place mm -hmm. so that you can intervene. The right way. Yeah, the right way. Okay, we have another question actually from Los Coveras. I know he or she, or they asked a question earlier. Um, are there other forms of heroin besides the black tar and the powder form? Yes, here in Arizona, we also see the brown powder, which can actually look, um, f it can certainly be brown like cocoa powder uh -huh. or even lighter than that, um, almost a whitish substance. You know, heroin can be snorted, smoked, and injected. So if there are people listening that are concerned, maybe they heard the signs and symptoms mm -hmm. today, and they're thinking, wow, I've seen that. Right. But I don't see track marks. It's not the only way to use heroin. So it's something you need to be aware of. You might also see around uh, someone using heroin aluminum foil uh, one side of it may be black and burned and the other have black marks on it mm -hmm. from smoking it you might also find things like this, this pen. pen that the tube has been cut out to use to smoke cut off straws things that literally if you saw that shoelaces were going missing, just consistently, could be another sign of heroin use. Wow. Things you wouldn't think about. Right, I mean, I wouldn't know this had you not come in and yeah. told me all of this. Okay, now this is from Chuck and Liz Herrera. Who is the typical user of heroin? Mm. Is so, there one? That's a great, you know? I like how you put that. Uh, I wouldn't say typical, because it is across the board right. but what i would say chuck is that the rising category right now uh -huh. of new users are the 20 somethings and is it a specific demographic of 20 somethings is it oh no. college kids is it you know wow certain good question. incomes is it i mean no it's this cuts across every socio economic um race religion that all goes out the window. But the increase we're seeing is in the 20 something year old new use. Mm -hmm. I think that has a great deal to do with the painkiller connection. Mm -hmm. So if I got started on Oxycontin, 
maybe I came to your house mm-hmm. and I went in your <laughs> your medicine cabinet. I, you don't know where it is. <laughs> I have a lot of cabinets. If I'm a in my user, place. I would find it. I have like 30 cap, 20, 30 cabinets. But in all seriousness, right. um, that there's a very strong connection sure. to, to that. And and quite frankly, the the new user category can often come into this through the innocent door, mm-hmm. I'll call it. In other words, I had a legitimate prescription because I had knee surgery or I had some other sure. reason, legitimate. Right. But after I refilled it and then refilled it again, and I'm you on my third refill. You just got so used refill. to it. That's where the addiction is more, I'm well, assuming? Well, it, it is, but also think about this. I try to stop using that painkiller. My pain is long gone. Mm-hmm. And I try to stop and what I have to go through to stop, I just don't want to feel. Right. The aches, the pains, the anxiety, the depression, the panic attacks. So you just want to keep using so that you have the more positive experience. Well, in a sense, yes. It's like now I just need it to just feel okay. Right. Well, those were all of our questions. I'm going to just pull up. Um, I think we have some comments just you know people sharing their own experience Carmen Gomez Montano or Montano that is the enemy and it ruins not only youth adults and an entire family seeing my ex overdosing on it and trying to bring him back to life was the scariest thing but I didn't know he was using it until after he came back to life I see young kids on it and it hurts me to see it because the enemy is taking over oh Carmen you are you're breaking my heart um, you know I'm a mom who has lived through substance abuse right. with a son the drug of choice was not heroin but it, it is devastating to the family um, and so I empathize with you so greatly I, I hope that this evening is just the start of many conversations right. here in Arizona that we raise the awareness because I don't want to see Carmen right. or any other family live through what we, we've all lived through. It's, it's life-changing. And by the way, this is forever. Even if you are able to conquer addiction, it is you're, you're a minute away from this the rest of your life. Well, Debbie, thank you so much for coming in and speaking with us. All you viewers, as I mentioned earlier, Hooked on Heroin, the documentary will be on air uh, on Fox 10 at 6.30 p.m. It'll be airing all across the state of Arizona and all the broadcast network. Also, I believe the radio stations as well. Yes, I think there are 32 stations. If you're out in the car as well, you can't catch it on TV. Make sure to listen to it. And um, I really appreciate you coming in. I feel like I learned so much um, just on the topic. And I will go home. I will crush my pillow. All right. Um, I've done my job then. Thank you. Thank you so much. And again, for all you viewers that um, have questions or concerns, make sure to visit notmykid.org. And if we can help your mm-hmm. viewers in any way, right. let us know how we can be a support and resource to you. Well, thank thank you. you so much. Uh, I'm actually going to I'm gonna be changing topics now. Great. I'm going to be switching over to Seacraft. We have a Jody Arias update. Okay. <laughs> Jody Arias. I see Steve over there. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I feel bad about my my, my drugs in my home. <laughs> Blame no, my dentist. But now you know what you have to do. Well, I guess you I, know, I I may follow up with you to find out that you did. <laughs> you know, here's the problem: if I had taken better care of my teeth earlier, I wouldn't yeah. have had to have the drilling Ugh, that yeah. caused the pain that required the yeah. painkiller. So all it right. all goes back to brushing two times right, a day and so flossing. Much. Thank you, and Steve, welcome. Hi. We have had you on many shows this week. Yesterday, yes, we have. I'm today, here again. We have you back, <clears throat> and Thanks. obviously, it is for a big story. Big story. Yes. Jody Arias. Now, this morning, we talked about how the transcript of her secret testimony was going to come out, and we speculated a lot. Well, viewers, Steve got that transcript. He sat down at his desk, he read through it, and now he is here with us to deliver some of the highlights. Well, 250 pages, 249 pages. So you didn't read all of it yet, right? To all 250? Lots you know of what? It's not that hard to read through it. Oh, it's, really? It, Did I you mean, get through all 250 pages? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very, um, you know, uh-huh. very double spaced. And um, 
a transcript isn't like reading a book. Right. You can breeze through it. It's also a pretty familiar story. Right. She did not really, as we predicted this morning, she did not go into areas that we had not heard about before mm -hmm. at all. Okay, well, what did she go into? I know <coughs> I still, I, I have some of your quotes up here. I'll pull up this one right here. That's great. I mean, uh, right out of the gate, Obviously what's happening here is her defense team has decided to try to inoculate her, to protect her against uh, very uh, strong attacks by prosecutors about the viciousness of this crime. Mm -hmm. So they want her to undergo friendly questioning in this secret session that happened last October, and they want to get it straight right from the get-go that she's admitting her guilt. So her attorney, Jennifer Wilmot, asks her, literally on page one of this 249 pages, right. have you already been convicted of convicting Travis Alexander? Arias says, yes. Wilmot says, and did you kill Travis Alexander? Arias, yes. So a flat, admit, you know, she's admitting it mm -hmm. very, very flatly, right, at, right from the beginning. So she's not trying to duck responsibility right. or say that the jury got it wrong or anything like that. She is a, a killer. Right. And, and she admitted that she was already found guilty for that. Yep. Right. And so that is one quote that you had pulled up. Here is another one. And this follows literally right after that because this happened in 2008. It wasn't until 2010, after a variety of bogus stories from Jody Arias, that she finally conceded that, yeah, I'm, I did it. First she said someone else did it, and then, she, you know, of course she maintained self defense. Right. But here the attorney says, why did it take you two years to admit that you did it? And she says, it took me that long to be able to admit it to myself that I did it. Her attorney, why did it take you that long to admit it to yourself? And Arias says, because, because what I did was so horrific that I couldn't have, I never, I could never have imagined doing that to another human being. Okay, now my question is, again, this is the internet, so we're allowed to speculate. Does she really feel that way or is her lawyer telling her to say that? I don't know. Because not, she was... She was. Who knows? I mean, those questions were from her own lawyer. Right. So... Because that's what a juror is going to want to know. Right. A juror is going to be thinking, geez, it sure has taken you a long time to admit that you're guilty in all of this. What's the holdup? You know, so... I mean, and it's a valid, I think... I mean, it, I think it is a valid response. It is, you know, and it's up to the... your own actions. Well, it's up to the jurors to decide if they take her at her word, if they think that sure. she's contrite about all of this, or if she's just trying to fake emotion. Now, of course, we have this question about lying to detectives about her guilt, and she did a lot of that for a long time. And now she's looking back at all of the lies she told for mm -hmm. years, some of them on network television shows. And she said, it is revolting. I look at that, I just think about how stupid I was. I was lost. Just, I think of but just those lies put so many people through, and I just wish I could. There are a lot of things I wish I could do over again, but that is just one of them. Now, every single criminal that's ever been always says, I wish I could do this all over again right. and not have done it. So that's kind of standard boilerplate for criminals of all kinds. But um, it's up, once again, for the jurors to decide if they right. think she really, really feels genuinely bad about this. Um, or if she just feels bad that she got caught and is paying the price for this and is looking at a miserable future in which she's either killed or in prison forever. I'm still just wondering, did she think she wasn't going to get caught? She took photos and left the camera there. No, it's it, it, I mean, again, there's so many questions of like why she did this or that or whatever. You nobody know, can parse this out. I mean, what she did was completely irrational and her behavior afterwards was peculiar, to say the least. Right. And um, her attempts to cover it up, in, in hindsight, were very clumsy. She was not a practiced career criminal. She right. had never committed a crime right. in the system until this monstrous crime. So we have this. So yeah. she was, you know, a, yeah. an amateur <laughs> when, it, when it came to this type of thing. Right. So, you know, she she went to Travis's memorial service. She sure. sent flowers to his grandmother. She left a phone message on his phone machine after she had killed him to make it seem that she hadn't been there. She went on a date all the way up in Salt Lake City the very next day. Right. Uh, when she eventually came back down to, uh, I mean, this is before the murder, she just, there were all kinds of cover-ups right. as well. And even behind bars, she 
clumsily try to get messages out to supporters by smuggling out messages in a magazine. There are just lots of things. She was a, an amateurish, ham-handed criminal at best. Sure. Okay, we have this next... Uh... Well, once again, this is getting, this is the, the really the first 15 pages of the 250 pages are by far the most interesting. Right. Because these are the key questions right up, right off the start. And, and so she, you can imagine she's bearing this guilt, whether or not she claims to remember it. Right. You know, you stab somebody 27 times, shoot them and slit their throat. You've got to remember something, I would think, and the average right. person might think, but whatever. So her attorney says, why couldn't you say something to somebody? And... Aria says, something like that is just, that is, I mean, I know who I am and who I have been my whole life, and I, for those few minutes out of my whole life, I was somebody that I wasn't, and I couldn't, I couldn't even face that. Who knows what she was thinking? And, and unfortunately, we were not allowed the opportunity to watch her. Right. This, this is, is what's so crucial. Testimony. This is what's so crucial about getting a transcript as opposed to sitting in a courtroom and studying somebody's face. Body language. Their body language. Right. So, you know, you can kind of tell if someone's just kind of reciting something or if they're genuinely moved and this transcript doesn't tell us if she had tears in her eyes or if she was making contact with jurors if she was staring down sure. or, you know we don't know what right her. and one of the things we had talked about earlier and when we were speculating you mentioned that she was gonna you know we were gonna learn about her upbringing her childhood mm -hmm. her teenage years her previous relationships mm -hmm. and possibly to create that emotional bond mm -hmm. with jurors and when you hear her say like you know, for that one moment in my whole entire life, mm. I think she's trying to similarly paint that picture that, you know, it, it was this one moment of rage and the rest of my life I'm just a normal person like you and me. Well, in you fact, know, I think is pages 15 through 249 are that. Are just that. All right. It's growing up at home, it's that her parents used to hit her with a wooden spoon or. Uh, that her dad was abusive and threw her against a door jam one time and she passed out and describes how she dropped out of high school as a junior, how she got involved in a bunch of relationships, mm -hmm. how she worked at Applebee's and Denny's and California Pizza Kitchen and some resorts at Big Sur and right. you know up in uh, near Medford, Oregon. She worked just bouncing around from restaurant to restaurant. She worked. Her dad had a restaurant at right. one time. She worked for him. And just describes a sort of humdrum life and you know different guys that she either lived with or hung out with and right and then also describes how she got involved in a kind of a multi-level marketing business for uh -huh. prepaid legal services and right. that's how she, that's met, where she travis. met travis that's where she met travis so we, i just pulled up another slide uh this is a, another quote mm -hmm. from jody arias right uh where what is this about well here they're asking her a little bit about um how she looks at what she did uh, how she sums up her behavior and she says it's completely discordant with how I lived my whole life and I couldn't even wrap my mind around the fact that I did that I can't even it is still hard to imagine because just who I know that I am and I think that's why it just took me so long to finally be able to say yeah I did that so she is that kind of sums up where she is now sure but it leaves so many questions because what she did was so, so it was an atrocity, basically, right. that she committed. And, and what she's never satisfied is a juror's natural curiosity to delve into what she was thinking at the moment she killed Travis. So That's one still of, a mystery. One of the, I was just going to say, one of the questions um, that was brought up in our afternoon meeting by John Hook, actually, was do we finally <laughs> find out whether what happened that day, those step-by-step -step moments, was he shot first, then stabbed, stabbed, and then shot. I mean, those very specific details, we've heard the prosecution allege certain things, but we've never heard it out of her mouth. Did we get any of that? The answer is a resounding no. Okay. Absolutely no light was shed on any of those questions because if you think about it the answers to those questions would probably help the prosecutors a whole lot more than they would help the defense attorneys she's guilty already right so if she sums up in this testimony right first i stabbed him 15 times and then mm -hmm. i shot him and i stabbed him another 12 times and then i dragged him out of the shower and then i slit his throat and then i dragged him back into the shower and then i ran the water to wash some of the blood right away. you don't want to remind people of the crime you then committed. i left this horrendous terrible scene and he rotted for five days until his roommates found him and then you saw this this blue bloated corpse in all of the uh, photos of the autopsy yeah that's how it went down I mean describing that would certainly for a lot of jurors probably say yep death penalty does right. her no good 
So all she can do is, is, is draw this, what you might think could be perhaps a convenient 45 minute blank mm -hmm. from the time she went into the house until she left the house or whatever. Um, and then just talk about how remorseful she feels and right. that it's all a blur and this is so out of character for her and she regrets it and she apologizes for it. And oh, by the way, let me tell you about the first 27 years of my life. All right, this is the last quote that uh, you pulled from the transcript. What is this one about? Well, this is kind of, I thought, the most powerful moment in the entire couple of transcripts over two days. Because mm -hmm. the judge, uh, in front of the judge and the jury and Travis's family, right, and attorneys on both sides, uh, Jennifer Wilmot, defense attorney, asks Jody, and when you see the pictures that were taken after he died, now these are the autopsy photos, awful, and you see the number of stab wounds that were there, how do you feel about that when you see that? Areas, again, I think that this is somebody that I cared about and I caused, I caused that pain, and those were his last moments, and it makes me sick, and I wish, I wish so badly that I could just do that whole day over again. To me, this rings hollow, and it troubles me, because yeah. it's, this is somebody that I cared about, and I caused that pain. You know, after all these years, right. it seems like she's very clinical about it, and watching her for all these months, I've never really gotten the feeling that she is sad that Travis is dead. Mm -hmm. I always get the feeling looking at her that this is subjective as a reporter. Right. That she feels that, you know, he was a jerk and he had what was coming to him and she regrets that it went down the way it did. And maybe she regrets killing him, especially now. Right. And maybe she regrets the trouble that she got herself into and the, and the pain she's caused his family and hers. Right. But the fact that he is out of the picture and not on the scene anymore, is she truly heartbroken over that? Or does she feel that she cut out a cancer and disposed of it. I mean, it's a can I mean, he may not have been a cancer to everyone else, but I oh, think no. in her he mind... Oh, no, loved him to other people. Yeah, for, in but, her but, mind, but it to was her, consuming her. I mean, that's... To her, thing. he was a... Uh, it's pretty obvious, I think, when you listen to the testimony and the alleged emotional abuse or right. dysfunctional relationship, that part of her wanted him desperately and part of her hated him desperately. Right. I mean, and it was just a very passionate right. And the fact, the fact that that they had. tormented relationship is no more, and that she cut literally cut it out. Right. Does she, you know? Does she lay awake at night thinking, "Boy, I wish Travis were still here." I, it's just hard to see that right. from from these remarks. Now, if she says this and she's dissolved in tears, and they're not crocodile tears, but they're right. genuine tears of regret and remorse, and how could I have done this? Then, as a juror, maybe you'd get a different picture than, than I'm getting reading the words on the page. Right, and we won't ever know. I mean, you weren't. We didn't. I won't we know. don't know. We don't know what her visual emotion know. was. Was it on? Was it recorded at all? But like video? No, it wasn't. No. Okay, so it was just a secret testimony. The only thing we have is the transcript. Was, I wouldn't say it was unprecedented. It's extremely rare for a judge to kick out. Uh, you know, you can say I'm not going to allow a camera in the trial. Right. But, but to how kick often out do you people, kick out? It's the right to the public. Yeah. yeah. The reporters. Well, you know, I couldn't even sit there and write it down on a piece of paper. Right. And people who are not reporters couldn't even sit there and watch it. Sure. It was a private trial for two full days. Right. Well, you'll have more on this story at the five, top of the five. Five and six. Five and six, yep. and you're going to go into more detail on what the other pages had. I'm assuming. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So, viewers, you can hear more about that. Is I mean, is the transcript going to be published on the Internet fully? Is anyone doing that? I don't know. Um, yeah, it's in a number of places. Oh, a number okay. of media outlets have, have taken the transcript and have uh, published the whole thing. links to it. So, okay. you know, anyone who's interested can get out on the web and, and find it. search Arias trial, uh, Arias testimony, uh, transcripts, and uh, the last you know few hours has popped up. All right. Well, I know that you have your story to work on, so I won't keep you up here yeah. for too long because, I mean, the five o'clock's in an hour. Oh, and yeah. I know you're a really good reporter and you can crank that stuff out fast. Well, I don't want to lean on editors who work really hard <laughs> back there and have them do everything last minute. Just okay. I'm sorry, editors. I'm going to... I'm not putting you on a guilt trip. I Am know. I? It's just we have so much to talk about, but oh. I'm going to let you go. I see Jude LaCava over there, and I'm actually going to talk to him now switch gears. Are we going to talk Ohio State football here? 
I guess we could, but you I actually know, was bringing James it. From Ohio. I was going to bring him on to talk about another Ohio boy, LeBron James. Oh yeah, because he, I'm a basketball fan. But we can talk about Le- Ohio. Boy. I mean, we might the, as well. LeBron was at the gate, but asked Jude. Yeah, okay. we'll bring Jude up here. All right, see you. Bye. Thanks Bye. for joining us, Steve. You bet. Mr. Jude LaCava, I had to have you on today because I like basketball. You know this. LeBron James, he's in town, taking on the Suns tonight. He will play tonight, and uh, the team is desperate. They've lost eight of the last ten. They are struggling. They're playing 500 basketball with such a high expectation, but LeBron will play, and uh, you know we'll see how it plays out. It's going to be quite a buzz in downtown Phoenix. So... I mean, let's talk about, I mean, there was a lot of hype going into the season. You know, the Cleveland Cavaliers, sure. you know, LeBron James had this big coming home thing, this article, you know, this letter he wrote. It's, would you, I mean, you're from Ohio. You're from Cleveland. Yes, correct. Uh, is it disappointing? Is it, what's, what's I think the it's morale a, I think it's like? a, I think it's a work in progress. I okay. mean, if I had to give you the cliff notes on this, I would say, very simply, Kyrie Irving is not Dwayne Wade mm-hmm. and Kevin Love is not Chris Bosh. And, and I say that because the chemistry of this team, mm-hmm. the expectation, there's a lot of work to be done. And I think it's going to take a year or two, just like it did in Miami. Right. I mean, the first year they didn't win an NBA championship. Right. They lost to Dallas. This is going to be a work in progress. Well, uh, okay, but LeBron only signed a year, right? I don't see him stiff in Cleveland twice. I, <laughs> I can't see that in his DNA. He is so proud. I mean, he was at the game last night for Ohio State and Dallas. Right. He flew there. Um He's proud to be from Northeast Ohio, from uh-huh. Akron, from Cleveland. So he's committed. I think he just wants to see some patience and, and some time for this team and this roster to come. It, it's going to be a year or two. And I, he even said when he was the very first practice, this is going to be hard. Yeah. This is going to be a challenge. Okay. You mentioned the Ohio State game. We can talk football, I guess. So we can go <gasps> change gears. I did not watch the BCS champion. Or uh, you're the BCS, only one that I BCS, know, maybe yeah, on the surface of the earth. I know, that may have I'm, a, it. I'm a bad person, I guess. Uh, so, can you give me the update? Because I, I can did give miss you the it. update. It, it was one of the most amazing three game runs for a backup quarterback in Cardell Jones. But to me, it, it, it was old school football control time of possession, run the ball, be very physical, and slow down that high up tempo. Oregon offense, and, and, and that's what Ohio State did. They controlled time of possession. They were much more physical. They they kept the ball and, and ran the ball and pounded the Oregon defense, mm-hmm. and they overcame four turnovers, and they did it in convincing fashion. I mean, that was a very impressive, almost throwback style of championship win. Yes. Wow. I missed a... You exciting, may, you, I missed an exciting game. If you were a Buckeye fan, you are wearing some Trojan. red here. So. I'm a Trojan. Yes. And we're not, you know... We aren't where we were a decade ago. Let's put it that way, as a Trojan speaking. Yes, you know. it's going to take time. But I'm I'm uh, taking a call from Mr. James, actually. So LeBron James. Yes, his right people. Right there. So we'll uh, Are you we'll move leaving? On. To, yes. Can you tell him hello? <laughs> I will. Tell I'll, him I'm going to come. I'll see what I'm I can. I'll come back with come something for you. Yes. Honestly, if I'm still on, I would love to know what LeBron James is. Uh, we're going to. Uh, we'll see you at the game. Okay, I need to get tickets first, but you got it. I'll work on it. We'll, we'll work on that. Okay. <laughs> Follow this story. I will. Let, just take that call and let me know. I'm somewhat jealous. <laughs> but um, We're going to talk weather now. I mean, we've been doing a lot of things. We've talked heroin. We've talked Jody Arias. We've talked sports. And now I have Dave Muncy here to talk weather uh, because it Look is at this lighting, this new lighting. You have I new know. lighting. You You're know, I wish you had had this, well, I wish you'd had this a couple of weeks ago because it's warm. Oh right! It feels good. You it can. Does. Oh yeah. Hopefully our viewers and can look tell at, the look difference. And look at, look at, look how I look. You look great. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for joining me. Obviously, it is a um, a busy day in weather too. This um, morning, I had no idea that there was going to be rain in Phoenix, and then I looked outside at like lunch, and I was like, why, why is it wet outside? I don't. I can solve happen? that problem for you. You can solve this. Yes. You personally. Watch my weather at night. I can watch your weather, but I can also pull up the weather graphics right now and get an update. There you go. Yeah, we, we talked about the fact that it was going to rain today and that this cold front was coming uh, through the state. You can see it moving through the state uh, at the present time. And uh, take a look at some of the amounts that we have had. Look at Paradise Valley, 75 hundredths of an inch, whereas down in uh, Chandler, for instance, 400 hundredths of an inch, Gilbert, 400 hundredths of an inch, 
20 hundredths of an inch in Queen Creek and up in Surprise too. Mm -hmm. So very scattered, scattered amounts, 24 hundredths of an inch uh, in Scottsdale. So uh, that that's the way it happens sometimes with mm -hmm. these storms when they come in. Mm -hmm. And this is the way things are, are looking right now. Uh, we can uh, get down in there and take a look. You can see the city. The storm is kind of passing the city here. Mm -hmm. Up north, we have a few scattered showers uh, working their way through. Still some snow uh, over in the eastern mountains, right. especially right now. And then as we look at Flagstaff, some snow up in the Flagstaff area as well. Uh, picking up almost four inches uh, in Flagstaff. Uh, and then down south, things not looking too bad, but... Uh, uh, certainly uh, things drying out just a little bit and then just some snowfall amounts eight inches of snow both Flagstaff 3.8 Belmont three inches and then Forest Lake uh, with two inches on the ground I have so, an image right here from uh, I think this is uh, that pretty yeah this is a snowball I believe this is an image at a snowball let's mm -hmm. see another image from snowball let me see if I have a this is uh, William Snow, courtesy of Darlene Hayes. And this is a rainbow from Chandler. Oh my, not nice, that's Another pretty. Another viewer sent this in, Kimberly Winfield. Which end do you suppose has the gold? <laughs> I'm wondering if anyone actually went to go find it. I'm has, sure a leprechaun or two. <laughs> and then what do we have? Uh, Prescott. Oh, this is oh, a snow yeah. from little Prescott, dusting courtesy up there. of Janice Wind. And then this uh, Groom Creek, Kenneth Smirk sent this in. Okay, just a little dusting out there as well. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's still nice to see, you know, the images that are sent in from our viewers. Yeah, yeah, it's nice that they take the time to do that and send them to us. We enjoy getting them. So, if you um, if you have a camera, and I think most everybody does <laughs> these days. I mean, if you don't have a camera, yeah. you at least have a phone, which That's probably right. has a camera. So, uh, send us a picture. We, uh, we sure like getting them. And then, of course, we can share them with so many people when we do get them. So. Right, right. You can pull it up on your in your weather forecast. Yeah. Looks like the storms are over. It's going to uh, uh, clear out through the night tonight. There's a little chance of rain tonight, mm -hmm. but uh, a very small one. And then uh, sunny tomorrow. Okay. Uh, and then mid-70s by the weekend, even though we'll see some clouds here and there. Okay. So we're basically going to have fairly pleasant weather. Yeah, fairly pleasant weather. There is still... Above average temperatures. Absolutely. There is still a uh, an advisory for snow in mm -hmm. some of our eastern mountains. Mm -hmm. So if you're traveling above the 7,000 foot level, that's the heaviest. Below there, one to three inches possible through tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. So just some advice, you know, be careful if you're out there. Note to self. There you go. I love having you up here. I always like I ending, ending my show with uh, Dave Muncy and Weather. There we go. You keep it's lighting. A, you keep warming the place I up mean, like it's this. It's a nice, pleasant note to end this uh, <laughs> webcast on. You know what I really wanted to get video of that I didn't get video of? And I didn't get to get an Instagram of? I was mm. really disappointed this morning. We had the Oscar Mayer uh, Wiener Mobile oh, out okay. in our parking lot this morning. And, and since I was preparing I was preparing for our 10 a.m. live stream, and I wasn't able to go outside and get that Instagram photo. And I'm very jealous okay. because, mm, you know, Know. Folks, if you have one, uh, send Jeff it. Moriarty, who's also part of this digital team, he got a lot of photos, and I'm oh, he jealous. did, huh? Yes. You should have him send you some. You know what? I I wonder. I'm just gonna pull up his Facebook right now oh, because that's it. I want to show. I want to show the viewers, and that's the only place I know I can get the photos right away. So I hope that Jeff isn't. <laughs> Oh, there it is uh, right there. I hope there, Jeff yeah. isn't upset that I'm going to pull up his Facebook and show our viewers, but I just think it's really cool that this was out in the parking lot, uh, you know, this morning, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, we... That is nice. I it's wish just really cool. I were an Oscar Mayer wiener. And those are the two, the pi wiener pilots, the, <laughs> the drive it around, the drive around, and they're, the go. driver's seat is Look called the hot dogger seat, and the yeah. other one is called riding shot bun. Now these are the <laughs> these are the uh, captions I'm reading. I don't know if it's just Jeff being really clever because he is really clever, or if these are actually things he found out straight from I them. And then know. this is the fourth photo. He has several comfy chairs and a TV, but no bathroom. Oh no! Uh oh! No bathroom. 
but that is I just think it's really cool just a lot of pit stops then. it's That's a really cool and I you know I know it that you, all, you always like coming up here and I always try to show you something uh, like yeah I like all unique. the extras so that I see I wanted I to show you that Excellent. you missed it out this morning I missed mm -hmm. out this morning our viewers and probably didn't beautiful see it. Snow I shots. heard I think that the I think it's in the area for a couple of weeks I think that's what I heard. Well, you know, I hope I'm not making that information up. It's not going to drive by you on the street and you're going to miss it. Right. You know, you're going to go, whoa, it's the Oscar Mayer Wiener truck. Right. So. And Jeff did just message me. They are indeed called the Hot Dogger Seat and Riding Shot Bun. He did not make up those up. There you go. Those are actually the official But names. he could have. He could have. He's clever okay. like that. Well, there anyways, Dave, thank you so much okay, for joining me. Okay, real good. Thanks viewers, for having thanks me. thanks so much for watching us. As always, to keep updated on all the breaking news as it happens, when it happens, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash Fox 10 Phoenix. And look how well lighted we are. We're very well lighted. So you'll get to see <laughs> lots of well lighted <laughs> broadcasts. <laughs> I'm Samia Khan. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.